on Wednesday, we integrated an NLATCH into the Handshake uh, and implemented a Handshake that would read and write that NLATCH in separate cycles. Today, we'll be integrating that NLATCH into a Handshake in which we both read and write that uh, NLATCH's value in the same cycle. And we'll be guarding against an instability uh, caused by that in the forward drivers in three different ways. And so we can start with uh, our one bit WCHB hand, handshake. And uh, we've got what we're trying to implement here on the left is uh, effectively a streaming XOR. It's a difference detector on the inputs. So whenever the input changes, uh, the output will be one. So we read in the input from the L channel, and then we emit the XOR of, of that value that we just read and the current value of the internal memory, which is the which is set to the previous uh, L value that we had received. And then we set L, we set V to that previous value. And so we're going to take this one bit handshake and we're going to add our internal memory where we uh, set it based upon uh, the output rails, output request rails, and then wait for its value to change on those output request rails. So we've got we've got this uh, one bit internal memory that we're writing every cycle at the moment, and we're just for currently just forwarding the the input to the output. So we've got everything but uh, this XOR right here. So now we need to figure out how to implement that XOR. And you know the, the standard approaches that we've learned so far, we would uh, take those two, one of, uh, you know, de delay insensitive, one of two encodings, and uh, do a delay insensitive XOR up here at the top. So we've got uh, L.F and V1 or L.T and V0. So if they're different, then we drive one. Uh, if they're the same, so L, F, and V0, L, T, and V1, then we drive uh, zero on the output. Now, that doesn't really tell us how to set the internal memory or how to wait for that internal memory to be set. Um, we've kind of lost the, the necessary information about that in our uh, forward drivers. And so, you know, we we anytime we receive a false we need to set v0 anytime we receive a true we need to set v1 uh, but r to f has both false and true and during that during that time where we're setting the n latch v is in its neutral state of 1 1 so v0 and v1 are both high also during that time l dot e can go low uh, at any time so we lose you know l can end up going into its neutral state as well Right, so L dot F will go down, L dot T will go down. Effectively, we lose all information uh, from our inputs here about the current state of the system, which means that we need to store that state effectively in the forward drivers rather than uh, in the input requests. So we need to take this uh, forward driver gate and split it out into the four different uh, cases. So we have, uh, we have LF and V0, we have LT and V1, LF and V1, LT and V0. And so when L is F, we know that uh, R0 and R2 will tell us that L is, is false. And we know that R1 and R3 will tell us that L was true. Now we can use these uh, internal kind of signals uh, to drive the output requests on RF. So R0 and 1 drive false on uh, the output, R2 and R3, drive true on the output. And we can then use these to acknowledge the input, so L.E goes down when any one of those four rails goes high. So now that we've got this kind of forward driver infrastructure that stores the, the state of the system, we can use it to uh, drive the internal memory. And so uh, R0 and R2 both drive V0 up because L was false. R1 and R3 both drive V1 up because L uh, was true. And then uh, we know when, when we, if we had an R0 uh, forward driver go high, 
that must have meant that V0 went high, which means V0, V1 must go low in response. And so we must wait for V1 to go low and acknowledge the transitions on the internal memory. So, however, we do know also that when L is false and V0 is set for R0, that these already agree. And so LF will drive V0 high, it's already high. V will not actually end up transitioning. And this is the same for R1. So L is true, V1 is set, V1, V doesn't have to transition. And so we can actually take can optimize this a bit by taking out these these uh, these conditions on R0 and R1. And then we also don't have to wait for any kind of transition uh, on the reset phase of R0 and R1. We can remove that and save ourselves some transistors and some uh, stack length. So the next problem is that uh, we have an instability on the forward drivers. So let's say that R.E is true l.f is true, and v1 is, is true. So r2 goes high. In that case, r2 will drive v0 high. There is a sequence of events where r2 is high, all of these are still high, so r1 is still high, and now r0, um, r0 is also high. So v is in its neutral state, so we have r.e and l.f and v1 and v0, which means that we have this, all the requirements, all the conditions for r0 to go high as well. And so r0 will go high. Then we have r2 and r0 high at the same time. So r.f and r.t will both be high at the same time, violating our encoding, right? Our, the mutual exclusivity required by our encoding. And so this will create an instability uh, not only in this process, but in downstream processes as well. And the same thing goes for R3 and R1. And so we need to protect against this instability. Effectively, we're trying to read and write at the same time, and we need to uh, we need to make sure that we, we wait for the write until only until after the read has completed. And there are three ways to do this, uh, dictated by kind of the three signals in in this, uh, in these conditions, right? So uh, the first approach would be to just say, all right, well, R2, we have to wait for R2 to be low uh, before we can ever drive R0. And so that's the uh, mutual exclusion uh, approach. So we, we protect, we basically create a mutex between the four drivers that would conflict. This ensures that R0 does not fire until after the reset phase, uh, you know, guaranteeing that R.E is low and that the input requests are low, and so uh, it won't fire again until the next cycle. This is the fastest of the three methods. However, uh, the transistor stack length on your forward drivers is often quite long because that's where you're doing all your logic, and this makes it longer, so it's often hard to make this uh, work as a strategy because it makes uh, it's it's quite difficult to find real estate in your uh, transistor stack length for your forward drivers. So the next approach is generally the easiest approach to implement, and that is that we wait um, to write the internal memory uh, until after the output requests have been acknowledged by a downgoing. Uh, uh, output enable. So r.e goes low. So if we don't change v until r.e is low, then an, a low r.e will prevent r0 and r1 from uh, firing during that time. But that also means that over here, we've already kind of waited for that input enable, or so that, that output enable to go low. So we don't need to do so again in the reset phase of the forward drivers. So this actually simplifies our uh, our reset phase a bit, uh, which is helpful for WCHB. Now, if this is not possible to do because of some kind of conditional output that uh, that doesn't guarantee that R E always changes every time that you uh, have these forward drivers, 
then you can also use the uh, input requests. And so it's the same kind of deal. We wait for the input requests to be reset as a result of this downgoing rule on LE uh, before we try to drive uh, any kind of transitions in our internal memory. And again, we have another uh, possible op optimization opportunity, which is because we've already uh, acknowledged the reset of our input requests, we don't need to do so again in our reset phase of our forward drivers. And so we can get rid of that. And so that covers kind of all, st all three strategies for uh, handling uh, kind of read and write simultaneously in a single process um, for an internal memory. And uh, on Wednesday, we'll be covering uh, kind of a larger system, a 32-bit adder. Uh, we'll start with the uh, with a PCHB uh, one-bit full adder already defined. Uh, you're welcome to work through that on your own. There are slides, there are appendix slides uh, showing that derivation in uh, the next lecture uh, for that. So let's get into some examples. So we're in lecture 11. And we're going to build this XOR unit. So in E1.act, we have the process definition for the XOR. We have an E1 of 2 input and an E1 of 2 output for L and R. Uh, again, we're using the uh, inject and expect files in PRSIM. So we don't define a source here. We only define the sync, and we leave uh, the channel L dangling for the simulator. Then if we look in E1.RC, you'll see that we've defined, we've, we've told the simulator about L. Again, this is a, a one of two encoding with a, uh, for the channel L, we inject values from E2 underscore L dot dat. This should be E1. Okay, so we inject from E1 underscore L dot that. For R, we tell it that it's a one of two encoding. For the channel R, and we should be expecting values from E1 underscore R. Again, there are two RC files. One is just E1.RC, where we have cycles instead of uh, advance, and we set fully random timing here. So we have an XOR. Uh, we have our E1 of 2 input on L. We have our E1 of 2 output on R. Let's start with a standard WCHB reshuffling to give us some structure. So L.D0. Uh, we wait for L.D0 and R.E to drive R.D0. We wait for R.D0 to drive L.E down in the reset phase, not R.E and not L.D0. R.D0 down, and that drives LIE up. So that's step one. Step two is we want to create, you know, add in our internal nodes. So we're going to have a C102 underscore R to start. Let's just do that. So this would be not a square out of D0 down. That's right underscore r dot d0 down, then this would be not underscore r dot d0 drives r dot d0 up. Same here, so underscore r dot d0 up, and that drives r dot d0 down. Okay. Now we need to create our data rails. So let's split these up uh, for r dot d0, r dot d1. And let's uh, wait for both r.d0 to or r.d1 to drive l.e down. Replicate here in the reset phase. And 
Wait for them both to be low, so R is in the neutral state before driving L.E up. Okay, so we have a one bit WCHB. Let's start thinking about our uh, internal memory. So we're going to have uh, two values, uh, V0 and V1. And when V1, when V0 is low uh, or something, we're gonna drive V1 high. When V1 is low or something, we're gonna drive V0 high. And then there's the invert, the inverse side. So V0 and something drives V1 low, V1 and something drives V0 low. Okay, so now we have some disconnected internal memory stuck into our handshake. Uh, we want to think about how to drive these forward drivers. So we have four cases, right? Uh, they, they disagree, so that would be L.D0 and V0 or L.D1 and V1, or they, sorry, they agree, which is this case, or they disagree, which is L.D0 and V1 or L.D1 and V0. Okay. So, but now we need a way to figure out these uh, kind of undecided things and we need to figure out a way to, re to wait for these transitions on reset. So let's break this up into its four constituent cases. Uh, and like, let's make this underscore uh, X and make it an under, make it an E1 of four. And then we're gonna have uh, another, all the output inverters on, on X. So let's do that. Uh, so this would be split up, have the first case there, zero, zero. The second case, um, we're gonna do this by normal kind of binary encoding. So uh, the second case would be what, zero, one? Let's see what I used in the slides. Oh, the second, the so R1 would be one, one. Let's just use that. But here we go, one, one. And that's x dot d one. Then we have zero one. And that's x dot d two. And then we have one zero. And that's x dot d three. Okay. These all need to be changed to x. And we need to create more forward drivers, more inverters for the other two. So <clears throat> x.d, two and three, two and three. Uh, we need to create rules that aggregate these for the output requests. So x.d zero or x.d one, both of those conditions drive r.d zero. So we're going to need another D, C1 of two. And X dot D uh, two or X dot D three drives R at D one. And we have the down going, so we have the uh, inverters in front of C elements. So uh, underscore R at D zero, drives R at D zero high. And same for one. Okay, we're gonna optimize that later. That's kind of a long uh, chain of gates. But for now, that gives us what we need to drive this internal memory. So in cases zero and one, V won't change because it already agrees with L. So L.D0 and V0, L.D1 and V1. But in x.d2 and 3, we need to we need to switch. We need to switch V. So we have uh, for x.d2, we need to drive V to 0. So this would be 
not underscore x dot d two. And for x dot d three, we need to drive v to one, following L. So this would be not x dot d three. We just verify that this is the same pairing that I use for one, one, zero. Yes. Okay. So then we need the uh, reset phase of the internal memory here. So we have for v1 underscore x dot d3 and underscore x dot d2 for v0. And we need to wait for those transitions down here. Now we haven't really done anything with reset phase yet. We need to split that out. But before we do that, let's think about this chain of gates. We have internal nodes on underscore X and underscore R. We have uh, four gates in between uh, our input requests and our output requests, right? So gate one is, is this, gate two is this, gate three is this, and gate four is this. Now, X is already part of a cycle going and uh, being acknowledged through uh, LE and reset. And so if we if we replace this with X, so X dot D one zero, X dot D one, or X dot D two, or X dot D three, then R is only part of one cycle. It's only part of the outgoing request cycle, which means that we can kind of scoot it back to use the internal nodes of the forward drivers. And we've done this before uh, in other processes. Um, but effectively, instead of instead of two gates here, we're just going to have not underscore, not underscore, not underscore, and not underscore. And that's going to drive r.d0 and r.d1. And so now our four drivers are just two gates. This and this. And these are being acknowledged by this. Does that make sense? Okay. So that simplifies our work that we have to do down here. Let's kind of build it out a bit. So these turn into X, then we get, we need to replicate this and we have not L dot D zero, not L dot D one for X dot D one. Now for X dot D zero and one, V doesn't change. So we don't need to wait for it. For two and three, V does change. So we have and not v1 because we're setting v0. And then for three, we have not l dot d1 and not v0 because we're setting v1. Okay. These four drivers, uh, these inverters all need to change to x. And I need two more for the other two cases, two and three, two and three. And then I need to drive uh, L dot E with X rather than, um, rather than R. So M not X dot D two and not X dot D three. Finally, we need to add in our rules for R. So, underscore x dot d zero and underscore x dot d one or d zero down and two and three for r dot d one. Okay. So there will still be an instability on x dot d zero and x dot d one. which we need to protect in some way. So I'm gonna go with the with using R dot E. That's the simplest case. It's the easiest to implement. So not R dot E. So we're gonna wait for R dot E before letting V transition. 
And the other side is just a combinational inverse of the set phase. If it's not combinational, then these turn into C elements. And so you have kind of a crisscross pattern with C elements, it, get, it gets really messy. So in general, you want, you want all of these expressions to be combinational with each other. So that allows us to not wait for r.e in these downgoing rules. So the reset of this whole system, we need to make sure that the forward drivers are reset low. So let's go ahead and do that. So in our usual not underscore g dot re, not g dot underscore s reset for the four drivers. So when reset is high, this signal is low. It's driving a PMOS, so it's inverted, which forces this these rules to fire. In the set phase, we need to prevent them from firing. So g dot underscore s reset and okay, and then we need to reset the internal memory. So the internal memory we're going to reset to zero. So we're going to force this rule and block this rule. And that will propagate out to V1 in general. Now let's see if this runs. And then we can do some optimizations. Underscore R, underscore X, X. I have all my internal signals. Let's do it. Make E1. Uh, and here's some E1 up here S. Well, let me open up my uh, VCLI. Here's some E1 back here S. Source E1.RC. Yep. And I can just cycle and have it go for forever. All right, so it works. Let's take a look at some possible optimizations to this. So we know that V0 is going to be reset high, which means V1 is going to be low. Okay. That means that we don't need these two resets because V1 is low, blocking this rule and this rule. So we can get rid of this reset and this reset. Now, if we go down here and we look at the reset rules for these two, we don't know the value of L.D0. And we don't know the value of L.D1 or R.D. So these must remain. But because we don't have the S reset on the other side, these must be the parallel reset because of the isochronic fork on the reset signal. OK. The next thing that we can do is for x.d0 and x.d1, v doesn't change. So if v doesn't change, then we don't actually need to split out the two cases. Let's see what happens when we combine them. So we have l.d0 and v0, or l.d1 and v1, get rid of x.d1.
we only need x dot d0, x dot d1 disappears, disappears in the forward driver. We can alias r dot d0 with x dot d0. So we don't need these rules. These are unaffected. And here we have to wait for both input requests to be low, signaling neutrality. Get rid of x.d1 down here and get rid of r.d0 because it's been alias to x.d0 and get rid of x.d1 here. Okay. Let's see if it works. Uh, so line 20, ah, I forgot a semicolon. Here's an e1.prs. Source e one dot rc cycle. Yep, it works. Okay. I think Did that you about... do that same optimization using the uh, mutex method? Uh, yes, you can. Um, for the mutex method, you would need to, uh, when L dot D zero, V zero will go high. So you need to and in underscore X dot D two here and and in underscore X dot D three here, because this one drives V zero high and V one low for L dot D zero. So that's X dot D two in this mm -hmm. case. And this one drives V1 high and V0 low. So that's L1, L1, X dot D3 should go here. Okay, and so, I see how to do that. Yep. Now the problem with the, with the mutex case, you'll see almost immediately here is we don't have much logic here. And yet, one, two, three, four, five transistors in series, right? And so there's there's really only very few times you can actually use the mutex case, and it's and it's okay. Um, I've used it in a series of five like this and just sized it up, and that was kind of fine, but it wasn't optimal. Um, so you know I can convert over to the mutex case entirely. Let's do that. Uh, so get rid of r dot e here. Get rid of r dot e here. And then here and here. And then I have to add it back into the resets here. So not R at E and, not R at E and. Let's see if that runs. Yep. So there's the mutex solution. We got one more solution. That's the input requests. So uh, let's get rid of the mutex, the mutexes here and here, and let's uh, condition these on the resets of the input requests. So for x dot d2, we don't want to drive v0 high until l dot d0 is low. For x dot d3, we don't want to drive v1 until l dot d1 is low. And then we need to uh, have the combinational inverse, so l dot d1 or and then L dot D zero or then we don't need to wait for these 
in the reset phase because we've already waited for them in the uh, internal memory. So we can just get rid of that and we can get rid of this. So in general, you need to keep track of what states the, the V values switch in uh, because if they don't switch every time you have a particular forward driver, you can't just wait for its switch in order to acknowledge the, you know, some of these extra rules, some of these extra terms. And so it's dependent upon um, kind of what, what transitions those, uh, those transitions acknowledge. So let's try to run this. Make it clean. Make e1. Here's an e1 dot uh, source e1 dot rc. And it works. So let's take a look at the analog simulation. Uh, PR, PR view test.spy.prn. And we have L0, L1, LE, R0, R1, RE, and then V0 and v1 let's zoom in a bit so v starts at zero uh l0 comes in first so we should we should see r0 on the output then we get zero again so zero xor zero is zero then we get one one xor zero is one then we get one, one XOR one is zero. Then, then it kind of alternates. So we get zero. Since it's different from the previous one, we get a one on the output. We get one, it's different than the previous one. We get one on the output. So every time it alternates, we get a, a, a one on the output. Then we get two in a row here. We get a zero again on the output. And you can kind of see that V doesn't always switch. And certain cycles take less time than others, right? So whenever there's a change, right? Whenever we go from one to the other, that takes a little longer because we have to wait for V to transition versus if we repeat two values, it's much quicker because we're not waiting for that transition. Um, and you see this in a couple of places. So here, uh, here, 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 All right? So in general, you're seeing that, that delay in sensitivity with certain things taking longer. Basically, they, they take as long as they need. 